Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Divine. I'm sure you've probably listened to a podcast or two of mine, but if you haven't, uh, my name is Divine. Uh, I love making podcasts. I love teaching people. And um, today we're going to be doing things a little differently. So this is going to be one of my first videos in a while. And, you know, God willing, I'll be making some other videos um, over the next... I just really want to start this habit of uh, putting in some videos every week on this YouTube channel. So essentially what's happening today is this is episode 348. Um, this will be the Clutch Hypercalcemia podcast. I will be uploading an audio version of this podcast on the website. But I will also try to be making video versions of the podcast and putting them on this YouTube channel for people that love YouTube. And as I do at the beginning of every podcast, uh, so I do have a course coming up soon. It's a step 2 CK, step 3 course. It's also relevant for the complex level two and three course, uh, two and three exams. But basically, um, it'll be on the 6th of December. We'll be having the test taking strategies class. It's a class that um, we go over a lot of very well tested, very high fidelity test taking strategies that'll help you a lot on the USMLE exams. Again, I've had more than a thousand people attend this course. They've done really well on it. Um, same thing from the 7th to the 10th of December. We'll be doing the 24-hour review course. Um, basically, we'll review PEDS, surgery, ob guy, internal medicine, psych, neurology, the multi-system processes and disorders, biostatistics, ethics, things like that. Healthcare systems, communications. Again, I've had many people attend these courses, do really well on the exams with them. So um, I'll encourage you, if you want to sign up, just shoot me an email through the website, divineinterventionpodcasts.com, and we'll go from there. Okay. So let's hit up hypercalcemia. Again, as I love to do, right, it's going to be a discussion. So why, what is hypercalcemia? I mean, hypercalcemia obviously means that your blood calcium is high, right? Uh, many times, if your blood calcium is high, if it gets high gradually, you may not have too many symptoms from it. But if it gets high really fast or it's really, really high, say above like 12.5 or thereabouts, you're going to start having symptoms. Uh, what are some of these symptoms that people usually have? Well, it's pretty straightforward, right? I'm sure many of you have heard of this, stones, bones, groans, and psychic overtones. Well, the stones are from kidney stones, right? Nephrolithiasis, flank pain, radiating to the groin, right? That's what you're going to see with those kidney stones because of that calcium that is precipitating in your, in your nephron. Remember, when you have kidney stones, right? Most times people have those problems at the ureteropelvic junction, right? So they'll have this flank pain, it's going to the groin, and you'll check their urinalysis and you see a lot of red blood cells. That's how you, those problems usually crop up. And then you're going to have bone pain, right? Because again, you're resorbing your bone. So it's almost like you're nuking your bone a bit. So you're going to have bone pain. Uh, you're going to have psychic overtones. Um, you're going to have a lot of muscle weakness, actually, constipation, abdominal pain. Those are all classic findings. So I know some of you may be like, ah, uh, divine. Where does, the, why, where does the muscle weakness come from? The thing is, calcium actually has the ability to block sodium channels. So think about it. Most of the muscles in your body, they need uh, sodium to rush in, depolarize the cell, and then the cell will fire, right? So if for some bizarre reason you've blocked those sodium channels, you're actually raising the threshold for the cell to be depolarized, your myocytes, and that can cause problems with muscle weakness. And then... You know, many times you see these people when they come in with hypercalcemic symptoms, especially when they're symptomatic, they usually will come in and they will have like polydipsia, polyuria. They'll be like super volume depleted. The reasoning behind that is that hypercalcemia actually causes nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So when your levels of calcium are really high, your body is not able to respond to ADH at the level of the principal cell of the collecting duct. And that will obviously cause problems. So... Hypercalcemia can cause a lot of things that are not pleasant, right? It can cause a lot of things that are not pleasant. And how do we treat a person that comes in with symptomatic hypercalcemia, right? Because many times you'll be a person, they'll say, oh, this patient comes in, they have abdominal pain, they may have like signs of depression, they may have these like altered mental status, uh, you know, skin tinting, decreased cap refill, you know, telling you they're hypovolemic, right? And again, but many times they will have abdominal pain. That's a very key finding to keep in mind. For exams, right? For those people, the first thing you always do is normal saline. The first treatment, first line treatment of symptomatic hypercalcemia is normal saline. And then after that, you can then start giving these people like IV calcitonin. You can even give them an IV bisphosphonate. Those things can certainly help. And 
One other thing our friends at the NBMEs love to test with hypercalcemia is if you look at an EKG, what are you going to find? Well, the thing is hypercalcemia is actually pretty specific in the fact that it actually shortens your QT interval. Don't get me wrong. There are many other things that can shorten your QT interval. But to be honest with you, the one you're likely going to test on your exam is going to be hypercalcemia. So whenever you see a shortening of the QT interval, always, always think of hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia can also prolong your PR interval, but that's something that's a little lower yield that I wouldn't worry much about. So let's go in and to the fun part, which I really love. Let's go in and start making some integrations on how people get hypercalcemia. Well, let's start. What if they give you a question about a, a patient? They tell you that uh, you know many family members, they've died from thyroid cancer. And then this patient presents, comes in, has a, you know, for the last two days, they've been altered, They've been having abdominal pain, they've been having constipation and stuff. Well, if you see that, I would really hope you're thinking about MEN2A, right? MEN2A. Uh, you may say, hmm, divine, but MEN1 can cause hypercalcemia as well, but MEN1 doesn't cause thyroid problems, right? So it's going to be MEN2A. Uh, remember, that's like uh, something that you get from a red gene mutation, autosomal dominant inheritance. And those people can have medullary thyroid cancer. That's the thyroid problem that's killing off all the family members. But it can also cause hypercalcemia, right? Because again, you can get primary hyperparathyroidism as one of the findings in MEN2A, right? And what is the most common cause of primary hyperparathyroidism, right? It's most commonly going to be like some kind of parathyroid adenoma or parathyroid hyperplasia, right? So your parathyroid glands are just making a ton of PTH. Well, if your PTH is high, then you're going to be raising your blood calcium levels. Your blood calcium will be high your phosphate on the flip side will be low, right? So if you have primary hyperparathyroidism, your PTH is going to be high. Your calcium is going to be high because PTH raises your blood calcium. Your phosphate is going to be low. Because remember, PTH, another term that many people use to remember what PTH does is that it's the phosphate trashing hormone, right? So if you trash your phosphate, then your calcium is going to be, again, I mean, your, your, your phosphate is going to be low. As, as I said, your calcium is going to be high, right? And because you have high levels of calcium, in your blood, you're also gonna have very high levels of calcium in your urine, right? That's something that's pretty unique to a person that has primary hyperparathyroidism. And many times, we just try to go ahead and remove these people's parathyroid glands. That's usually the smart thing to do. But uh, there's some criteria that you kinda need to keep in mind, right? As to, mm, we should go ahead and remove this person's uh, parathyroids, right? So if, for example, you're symptomatic, as a result of your hypercalcemia, we should probably go ahead and remove your, your parathyroid glands. If you're a person that is young, right? So like most times, if you're under the age of like 50 or thereabouts, we also usually prefer to just go ahead and remove your parathyroid glands, right? And if you begin to have like sequelae from that hypercalcemia, like let's say your kidneys are beginning to like, woo, right? Your kidneys are beginning to fail. I mean, those circumstances, you should also certainly go ahead and remove that person's parathyroid gland. So, um, one thing I guess I should say, since we're trying to make integrations here, is it's actually kind of important to remember that since we're kind of talking about, you know, removing the parathyroids, remember you can inadvertently mess up the parathyroids from thyroid surgery, right? In fact, that is the most common cause of hypocalcemia, right? Most times you see people, they get hypocalcemia because they're doing thyroid surgery and then the surgery kind of gets botched and then you inadvertently mess up the parathyroid glands, right? We'll probably talk about that in a separate podcast on hypocalcemia. I just really want to focus on, on hypercalcemia today. So again, don't forget, primary hyperparathyroidism, you can find it in the MEN syndromes, MEN1, right? And also MEN2A, right? Remember, uh, primary hyperparathyroidism is actually the first, is actually the most common manifestation of MEN1. If you're looking more along the lines of MEN2, the most common manifestation actually of MEN2 is uh, medullary thyroid cancer. Okay, so what are some other things that can cause hypercalcemia? Well, another thing that can cause hypercalcemia is if, for example, a person has a familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. This is something that many med students tend to struggle with on MBME exams, right? So uh, what's the thing there? Well, the thing is when you secrete calcium in the body, right? When your blood calcium is high, that goes to your parathyroid glands and tells a particular receptor. It's called the calcium sensing receptor. It tells your body, uh, you know what, let's go ahead and shut down the production of PTH, right? So that calcium sensing receptor says, okay, wow, there's a lot of calcium. Like literally look at the name, calcium sensing receptor. It senses that your calcium is high, right? So it says, okay, let's go, let's go ahead and shut down this PTH production. 
But if for some bizarre reason, um, your, your calcium sensing receptor has like a loss of function mutation, then even when your blood calcium is high, it won't tell your parathyroid glands to downregulate PTH production. So those people, they're gonna have PTH that is being produced, right? They're gonna keep raising their blood calcium levels. But then, they're not downregulating the PTH in response to those elevated blood calcium levels, right? So when you see a person that has FHH, right? Again, familial hypocalciuric, hypercalcemia. Those people will have elevated blood calcium levels, right? But the key, because you may say, oh, divine, so how do I differentiate this from primary hyperparathyroidism? Well, the big way to differentiate this is by looking at the urinary calcium. I mean, the name of the disease <clears throat> already tells you what you're dealing with. Familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. So your blood calcium is high, but urinary calcium is low. So why is the urinary calcium low? I know some of you may be like, uh, divine, yeah, the calcium in my blood is high. Of course, the calcium in my urine should be high. Well, not, not so fast. The thing is, again, you will understand this easily when you look at the perspective of the body when it has high calcium, right? Again, we said that when your blood calcium is high, your body is going to try to shut down PTH production. But again, the link between your blood calcium being high and your body shutting down PTH production is the calcium sensing receptor. Your kidneys, when your blood calcium is high, your kidneys are like, mm, you know what? We're going to go ahead and uh, dump as much calcium as possible in the urine. Again, you can only do that when your calcium sensing receptor is sensing calcium properly. So if your blood calcium is high, but your calcium sensing receptor doesn't work, your kidneys do not know to dump calcium in the urine. Instead, you're going to be reabsorbing a ton of calcium from your urine. So you're going to have low calcium in your urine, right? Now, one key thing to say, because if you notice for primary hyperparathyroidism, I was like, oh, you know what? Let's go ahead and treat it. Uh, you actually don't treat FHH. This is actually very high yield to know. Our friends at the MBA means every now and then they write questions where we assure the patient or, um, or you know, no further treatment is the right answer. Familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia is one of the classic examples of that kind of thing. Now, let's go on to another cause, right? So what if they give you a question about a patient, you know, they tell you this patient um, has a history of well-controlled bipolar disorder and the person, again, has this elevated calcium. Uh, on a, you know, when you do like a basic metabolic panel or things like that. Well, if you see stuff like that, what should you be thinking about? Well, I really hope you're thinking about hypercalcemia from lithium, right? Remember, lithium is a drug, is one of the first line agents for treating uh, bipolar disorder, right? But how exactly does lithium cause hypercalcemia? The thing that lithium actually does is it raises the threshold for your parathyroid gland to secrete PT. I mean, to, uh, to, Actually, let me put it this way. It lowers the, you know, I want to try to make things a little easy for you. Basically, it tricks your parathyroid glands. I think this is a nicer way to state it. It tricks your parathyroid glands into thinking you need higher than normal calcium levels to suppress your PTH. So let's say, for example, oh, if your blood calcium reaches 11, your parathyroid glands are like, woo, blood calcium too high. Let's shut down PTH. Lithium essentially can trick your parathyroid glands into saying, you know what, we're not going to lower PTH production until our blood calcium is like 15 or 16, right? So it basically raises the calcium threshold needed for your body to suppress PTH production. That's essentially how lithium causes hypercalcemia, right? Alternatively, they can give you a question about a patient and they tell you that he's like a 75-year-old guy, you know, he has this, uh, you know, for the last two, three months, he's been having like back pain, but that over the last three days, you know, he's been having, again, those classic signs of hypercalcemia, you know, stones, bones, groans, psychic overtones. And then they say, oh, what's the most likely etiology? Well, I really hope you're going to pick the answer that says uh, prostate cancer, right? This guy has prostate cancer that has metastasized to the bone, and that's essentially what's causing his symptoms. And remember, if a person has hypercalcemia because of some kind of malignancy, what drug should those people be on? Those people need to be on bisphosphonates, right? Remember, uh, bisphosphonates are the drug, drugs of choice for hypercalcemia or malignancy. And how exactly do bisphosphonates help? The thing is bisphosphonates, osteoclasts pick them up. And then when osteoclasts pick them up, then the osteoclasts stop working, right? It's almost like they're a poison pill for osteoclasts, right? So your osteoclasts swallow them and it then just causes them to like go off and die. It essentially causes um, apoptosis of your osteoclasts, right? So that's how... Um, bisphosphonates are very helpful. They are the, actually the drugs of choice for treating hypercalcemia of malignancy. Now, the thing is, 
Our friends at the MDMEs, they love having a failed day with malignancies and hypercalcemia, right? So let's kind of hit up a few more of these malignancies that cause hypercalcemia, right? So what if you see hypercalcemia in a person, they tell you that, oh, you know, this person for the last two weeks has been having like hemoptysis, so coughing up blood. And then they tell you that imaging of the chest shows like a speculated mass, a speculated cavitary mass. If you see this, right, this is gonna be squamous cell lung cancer, right? When a person has squamous cell lung cancer, remember, uh, squamous cell lung cancer loves, 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 loves to form um, cavities, right? Whenever you see a cavitary lesion and it's a malignancy, you should be asking yourself, why is this not a squamous cell cancer? And to be honest with you, just in general, squamous cell cancers love to cavitate in the lungs, right? And remember, if you were to biopsy those stains, you're gonna see these keratin pearls, right? Keratin is a defining feature of epithelial tissue, especially again, like squamous epithelium, right? So why does this person have this hypercalcemia? Well, don't forget, squamous cell cancers love to produce a PTHRP, right? Parathyroid hormone-related peptide. So they make PTHRP, it pretty much works like PTH. So your blood calcium is gonna be high and your blood phosphate is gonna be low, right? But your endogenous PTH, right? So the PTH that like your actual, actual body makes is going to be low, right? So the PTHRP will be high, but your endogenous PTH is gonna be low, right? So that's the mechanism behind the hypercalcemia in a person that has squamous cell lung cancer, right? Or what if they give you a question about a patient that has hypercalcemia and they tell you that, you know, they have like renal failure, their hemoglobin is like eight and their MCV is like 83, right? So they have like a normal cytic anemia in the setting of hypercalcemia and renal failure. Well, that's easy. What do you think that is? That's going to be multiple myeloma, right? Multiple myeloma. Remember, multiple myeloma, uh, one of the things that those plasma cells makes, that's a little unfortunate, um, is interleukin-1. Interleukin-1, another name for it is osteoclast activating factor. So you're going to activate the osteoclast and you're going to resorb your bone. If you resorb your bone, your blood calcium is going to go up, right? So that's why we have these uh, affectionately described, I guess, uh, crab symptoms of multiple myeloma. The C, right, is the hypercalcemia again, from interleukin-1. The R, right, is renal failure. The A is anemia. And then the B is bone pain, right? So again, just in general, malignancies, prostate cancer in men, breast cancer in women, those things can certainly cause hypercalcemia. Multiple myeloma can certainly cause hypercalcemia. Um, squamous cell cancer of the lungs can certainly cause hypercalcemia, right? So these are all things you want to keep at the back of your mind as you're studying for your exams. Now, think about it. What if they give you a question about an African-American female and they tell you that on chest x-ray, you can see like, uh, you know, like diffuse lymphadenopathy, right? And this person has like some interstitial infiltrates and they tell you that she has this, these painful lesions on her, on her thighs and on her legs, uh, painful red circular lesions. If you see this, what are you thinking about? Well, I would really hope you're saying, oh, divine, Pfft. this is sarcoidosis. I mean, African-American female. What exactly do you, what else do you think you will be, right? It's going to be sarcoid. So you may be like, huh, divine. How can a person that has sarcoidosis have hypercalcemia? Well, remember, sarcoidosis is one of those uh, granulomatous diseases. To be honest with you, this thing I'm about to tell you now is a general rule. You should take, keep in the back of your mind, I guess that ever-expanding back of your mind. You should keep in the back of your mind with any kind of granulomatous disease. Any granulomatous disease can, on MBME exams, cause hypercalcemia. So what's the mechanism there? The mechanism is from actually vitamin D excess, right? So how do you get this vitamin D excess? Well, the thing is, granulomas have these epithelioid macrophages that surround them. It's almost like they are bodyguards that are keeping that thing in check. Well, what's that thing that they are keeping in check? The thing they are keeping in check, right? It can be like a bug, right? So it can be like these uh, endemic fungal infections, like, right, like cryptococ, uh, like, uh, you know, histoplasmosis, coccidiomycosis, blastomycosis, it can be something like TB, right? But it can also just be inflammation, right? From something like sarcoidosis, right? So those epithelioid macrophages, they actually express an enzyme that you'd ordinarily find in the kidneys, 1-alpha hydroxylase. Remember, the job of 1-alpha hydroxylase is to convert calcidiol, which we also call 25-hydroxyvitamin D, to calcitriol, which we also call 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. So those macrophages, since they express that 1-alpha hydroxylase enzyme, you're going to be making a ton of vitamin D. And well, what does vitamin D do? It essentially makes you reabsorb calcium in your gut. Remember, we reabsorb calcium in the duodenum, right? We reabsorb calcium in the duodenum. So you reabsorb that calcium in your gut, you're going to have a hypercalcemia, right? Again, I can totally see our friends at the MBMEs. 
they can put hypervitaminosis D as the mechanism behind hypercalcemia in a person with sarcoidosis. And I know some of you may be like, Divine, we were talking about the sarcoid patient. Why were you making this big fuss about these painful red circular lesions on their lower extremities? Well, I would really hope that's getting you to think of uh, erythema nodosum. Remember, erythema nodosum is something our friends at the MDMEs, they love to test, right? They love to test it in the context of sarcoidosis, but they also love to test it in the context of people that have coccidiomycosis. Remember, coccidiomycosis is the fancy lung infection you get when you hit up the southwestern United States, you know, Arizona, Nevada, California, at least many parts of California, Texas, New Mexico, El Paso, you know, places like that. Those are places you get into hot water with um, when you when you have a coccidiomycosis. Again, any granulomatous infection, to be honest with you, they can even give you a fancy question on the NDMEs about like a young guy, you know, that has hematuria, um, has sinusitis, right? They tell you that he has a saddle nose deformity and he has hypercalcemia. That's going to be Wegner's, right? Remember, Wegner's, though, we've kind of changed the name in recent times. Uh, these days, we call it uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Look at the name, granulomatosis, right? So you have a lot of granulomas. Those granulomas, again, the epithelioid macrophages that surround them, they make one alpha hydroxylase, right? So you make a ton of calcitriol. That's going to cause hypercalcemia. So that's very high yield to keep in mind, right? Again, the thing is, the more recent MDMA exams over the last few months, they're not going to be exams that you're going to answer correctly by just knowing buzzwords. No, you need to actually understand pathophysiology. And you need to be able to make these integrations between different organ systems. The thing is, it's not like the MDMEs are just inventing new knowledge they are testing. Mm, no, right? There's only so much new knowledge you can invent, um, at least in a short time frame, right? The thing they just do these days is they just find newer, fancier ways of testing things that you should already know, right? So again, it's just something to keep in mind, right? Now, what if they give you a question about hypercalcemia in a person and they tell you that this person has AFib, this person is tachycardic, this person has hyperreflexia, Right? And they tell you this person has like bilateral lower extremity uh, edema. Well, if you see this, I really hope you're thinking about hyperthyroidism. Remember, hyperthyroidism can certainly cause hypercalcemia. Well, how does it cause it? Well, the thing is, one of the things that uh, thyroid hormone does is it makes you make a ton of interleukin-6. Well, what does interleukin-6 do? Well, interleukin-6 is kind of similar to interleukin-1 in the sense that it can activate your osteoclasts. So you're going to have hypercalcemia as a result of that. So that's very high yield to keep in mind for your test, right? But you may say, okay, divine, why does this person have AFib? This person with hyperthyroidism. Well, remember, a thyroid hormone can put more beta-1 receptors on your cardiac myocytes, right? So if you're throwing all those uh, beta-1 receptors, right, you can already begin to see that you can overstimulate or hyperstimulate the heart and get AFib. Actually, believe it or not, the most common arrhythmia in people that have hyperthyroidism is atrial fibrillation, right? So that's something you want to keep in mind on exams. Now, what if they give you a question about a person, person was recently started on some kind of uh, antihypertensive and they have hypercalcemia? What should you be thinking about? What should you be thinking about? Well, I hope you're saying, oh, divine, this is probably a thyroid diuretic that's causing the problem. Well, how does that work? Again, if you notice for me, I'm not very big on giving people facts with no context. No, I love you to understand facts, but I mean, to get the facts down, but you also need to kind of understand what's going on. The thing is, when you have understanding, then you're going to be able to see through the fluff that they throw in questions to try to mess up your head, right? So why do thiazides cause hypercalcemia? Well, it all boils down to how thiazides work. Remember, thiazides, they work at the level of the distal convoluted tubule, right? Remember, they inhibit that sodium potassium, I mean, that sodium chloride symporter that we find at the level of the distal convoluted tubule. Well, so how does that relate to hypercalcemia? Well, if you think about it, the distal convoluted tubule on the urine side, it has that sodium chloride symporter. On the urine side, it also has um, a channel that helps you reabsorb calcium. That channel is actually, it's actually activated by parathyroid hormone. That's actually one of the ways that PTH increases calcium reabsorption in the nephron. Now, on the blood side, which is like the opposite side of the urine side, we have something that we call the sodium calcium exchanger. The sodium calcium exchanger. Remember, sodium is primarily an extracellular ion. So the way the sodium calcium exchanger works is that sodium comes down its concentration gradient into the cell. And then that gradient energy from sodium coming into the cell is used to pump calcium out of that distal convoluted tubule cell. So think about it. If you take a thiazide diuretic, right, and you block that sodium chloride symporter, what does that do to the intracellular concentration of sodium? 
it's going to bring it down. The amount of sodium literally inside that distal convoluted tubule cell is going to be down. If that goes down, then that's going to strengthen the gradient of that sodium calcium exchanger. Because essentially, it's like you're lowering the amount of sodium inside the cell. But there is a ton of sodium outside the cell. So the gradient energy gets bigger. So that sodium calcium exchanger is going to work even better, right? So more sodium is going to rush into the cell because it's trying to equilibrate. It's trying to rush down its concentration gradient. And as more sodium is coming in, you're going to be pumping out more calcium from that distal convoluted tubule cell, right? So, and as you pump out more calcium from that distal convoluted tubule cell, then that calcium uh, transporter that is on the urine side is going to be like, oh, there's low calcium inside the cell. Okay, whoa, let's bring in more calcium. Let's bring in more calcium. So essentially, you're going to be lowering the amount of calcium in your urine, but you're going to be raising the amount of calcium in your blood. That is why thiazide diuretics are truly good in people that have nephrolithiasis. You can reduce your risk of future nephrolithiasis by taking a thiazide because you are sucking out more calcium from your urine and you're putting more calcium in your blood, right? So again, that's kind of high yield to know. Again, that's just a nice way to tie together and understand how thiazide diuretics can cause hypercalcemia. Now, remember, Gittleman syndrome, right, is like taking a thiazide diuretic. Remember, that's like an autosomal recessive disease where you have, again, like a loss of function mutation in that sodium chloride same order that we find at the level of the distal convoluted tubule, right? So remember, Gittleman syndrome, Gittleman, Gittleman, Gittleman syndrome can certainly cause hypercalcemia. I just figured I'll mention it since we're talking about uh, thiazides, right? And remember, Gittleman syndrome actually has a weird, bizarre association with a person having uh, calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. Well, again, it kind of makes sense because if you are if you have a disorder where you're reabsorbing a ton of calcium, that calcium can begin to deposit in your joints, right? So you can have like that chondrocalcinosis that we often find in joints, especially the knee joint in a person that has a Gittleman syndrome, right? And then remember, if you're taking a ton of vitamin A, right? If a person has hypervitaminosis A, that can also cause hypercalcemia. I'm going to be wrapping up this podcast, uh, I guess, video in this case soon. Right? But when you have a lot of vitamin A, vitamin A is a very powerful stimulator of osteoclasts. So that can certainly cause a hypercalcemia. Right? Another classic hypercalcemia question they can raise for you on exams is they can tell you about a person that is taking like some over-the-counter stuff because they've been having like a lot of heartburn, a lot of peptic ulcer disease. Right? Why would those people... And then they tell you that you know over the last two, three days, this person has been having like altered mental status, nausea, vomiting, feeling lethargic, things like that. If you see that, I really want you to think about something we call the milk alkali syndrome. The milk alkali syndrome. So this is going to be in a person, this is essentially a person that has hypercalcemia because they're taking a ton of antacid, right? So if you take a ton of antacid, well, so these antacids contain a lot of calcium, right? So as you're taking all that calcium in, you can get hypercalcemia, right? And many times that extra, excess calcium load is going to start saying bye-bye to your kidneys, right? So person's kidneys stop working. So you're going to see the person's creatinine uh, elevating. Right? And again, because many of these antacids are basic, you're essentially raising your blood pH. Right? So let me tell you this. Milk alkali syndrome is going to be a triad on your exam. It's going to be the triad of hypercalcemia, renal failure, and metabolic alkalosis. If you see that cluster together, I really want you to think about milk alkali syndrome on your exam. And then again, as I wrap up, I think one thing I want to try to differentiate for you on exams is differentiating secondary hyperparathyroidism secondary to liver disease, from secondary hyperparathyroidism, secondary to kidney disease. This is something I've talked about in many different podcasts. I'm going to probably talk about it again in the hypocalcemia podcast. But again, it's something that you cannot hear too much of, right? So if you think about it, again, if you have kidney disease, kidney disease, actually end-stage disease, is the most common cause of um, secondary hyperparathyroidism in the U.S., and especially on USMLE exams, right? So why is that? Well, if your kidneys don't work, again... I don't know where you're going to be getting one alpha hydroxylase from if you don't have like some little sarcoidosis going on in the background, right? So if you don't have one alpha hydroxylase, your calcitriol is going to be low. You're going to have low vitamin D. If your vitamin D is low, you're going to reabsorb less calcium from the gut. So you're going to have hypocalcemia. If you have hypocalcemia, then your PTH is going to go up, right? So you're going to get secondary hyperparathyroidism. So I know some people may think, oh, divine, oh, my PTH is up. So that means my phosphate must be low. Well, the answer to that is no. Right? Because remember, yes, PTH is the phosphate trashing hormone, but it needs your kidneys to help you trash that phosphate. So if you have kidney disease, you're not going to be able to trash that phosphate appropriately. If you can't trash the phosphate appropriately, right, you're going to have a buildup of your phosphate, right? So whenever a person has secondary hyperparathyroidism from kidney disease, 
their blood calcium is low, their pH is high, but their phosphate is going to be high because they cannot appropriately trash said phosphate. But if you have liver disease, because remember calcidiol that goes to the kidneys to be trans transformed to calcitriol by 1-alpha-hydroxylase, where do you think it comes from? It comes from the liver. So if you have liver disease, right, you're not making calcidiol, so you're going to have a vitamin D deficiency, right? So again, you're going to have low calcium. But because you have low calcium, your pH is going to go up. But your phosphate will be appropriately trashed this time because your kidneys work. It's your kidney that your kidney is working well. It's your liver that is dysfunctional um, under these uh, circumstances. So again, just high yield things to kind of keep in mind, right? But I guess since we're talking about hypercalcemia, let me extend this kidney disease problem uh, a little bit further, right? So let's say a person has institutional disease, you know, they've developed secondary hyperparathyroidism as a result of that. And then you give them brand new kidneys, right? You know, get a kidney transplant problem solved. And then you notice that, man, after this person got this kidney transplant, they're very hypercalcemic. If you see that, what do you want to think about? I want you to think about something we call tertiary hyperparathyroidism. I want you to think about tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So what's causing that tertiary hyperparathyroidism? Well, think about it. Let, let me maybe help you understand it this way, right? So let's say your kidneys are used to, because... If a person has secondary hyperparathyroidism, they are chronically hypocalcemic, right? Your parathyroid glands are making a ton, 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 ton of PTH, right? They're making a ton of PTH. Now, when you you get new kidneys, you will think that, oh, your parathyroid glands will be like, oh, problem solved. Let's stop making a ton of PTH. No, they don't stop. The thing is, think about it, right? How easy is it for you to break a habit that you've sustained over a long time period? Not very easy, right? So think about it. If, uh, I mean, if people could break habits easily, I uh, won't be having a big problem with obesity um, in, in the healthcare system, right? So the thing is, if your parathyroid glands are used to making a ton of PTH, after your kidneys have been fixed, they're not going to respond to those signals. They're still going to be making a ton of PTH, to be perfectly honest with you. They'll make a ton, 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 ton of PTH, right? And because your kidneys are working well now, you have one alpha hydroxylase around, you're going to be having a lot of hypercalcemia, right? You're going to be having a lot of hypercalcemia. And really the mechanism, because some of you may be like, Divine, is it that the, the parathyroid glands just decide to stop listening? No, it's not that they decide to stop listening. The thing is, whenever your parathyroid glands have secreted PTH very, at a very high level for a long period of time, those parathyroid glands, they're going to start downregulating the calcium sensing receptor. So when they downregulate the calcium sensing receptor, that's going to make them not respond to those elevated calcium signals anymore. Right? So the thing is, tertiary hyperparathyroidism, you're going to see it as a person that has hypercalcemia after they've gotten a kidney transplant. If you see that, I really want you to think about tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Tertiary hyperparathyroidism, right? Again, that's just a good way to kind of think about that. Um, and again, what ways do we treat tertiary hyperparathyroidism? You know, if they're trying to get you to pick a surgery, you can take out three and a half of those people's parathyroid glands. Just take away three and a half of it, and they'll be fine. Alternatively, one other thing you can do in terms of pharmacotherapy is to give the drug Sinacalcet. So Sinacalcet is a drug that makes your body suppress PTH production at lower calcium levels. So let's say normally your body suppresses uh, PTH production at a calcium level of like 11. But with Sinacalcet, your body is able to suppress PTH production at a calcium of like 9, right? So the thing is, Sinacalcet, the way it works is it actually sensitizes your calcium sensing receptor. It makes it like super sensitive to calcium. So just a little calcium in the blood. And your calcium sensing receptor is like, Ooh, let's stop PTH production, right? So that's essentially how, how it works, right? And the final thing I promise I'll say about hypercalcemia, and then we'll wrap up, is if a person has hypercalcemia because of a vitamin D cause, many times the drug that will help those people is steroids. Steroids are very, very, very good. Very, very, very good at... Um, shutting down uh, hypercalcemia when you have elevated levels of vitamin D. So if you see a person having hypercalcemia and it's symptomatic, right, or you want to keep them on maintenance therapy, they have sarcoidosis, putting those people on some steroids will be helpful because the steroids, one, will help with the sarcoidosis. But then secondly, the steroids will also help with the, with the um, hypercalcemia from the hypervitaminosis uh, D. So I think I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Again, as I do at the end of every podcast, I do offer one-on-one um, you know, -on -one tutoring for many exams, step one, step two CK, uh, preclinical 
uh, preclinical med school exams, step three, third year shelf exams. I do also offer review courses, again, for step 2CK and step three and complex level two and three. And then if you need help with your ERAS applications, like mock interviews, um, personal statements and things like that, I also help with stuff like that. And I have all these podcasts, right, on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, and on, on Spotify. Um, so at least the most recent 150 podcasts, you can find them on those, uh, on those things. And then obviously, if you're watching this video, please hit that subscribe button. Um, uh, again, the YouTube channel, Divine Intervention, USMLE Podcasts and Videos. That's where I post all the videos that I make. And again, I'm going to be making a lot of videos. I've kind of figured out a streamlined uh, process. So I'm going to be making a lot of videos um, over the next few days to weeks here. And then um, if you go on the website and subscribe, uh, divineinterventionpodcasts.com, you'll get an email notification whenever I make a new, a new podcast. And then also many people have said, oh, Divine, you know what? I really love the life lessons you post at the end of every of, of some of your podcasts. So I've actually started a whole new website. It's called Divine Intervention Life Lessons.com. I believe right now I have about 35 episodes that I've made. I make about two episodes a week. And, you know, just a short podcasts, you know, some are maybe like 20 minutes longer thereabouts. But most of them are pretty, pretty short. And I talk about like a Bible-based life lesson. Again, many of you know I'm a Christian. So I talk about like a Bible-based life lesson that just applies to a common problem that people are facing in the world today. And I actually also have the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Um, it's called the Divine Intervention Life Lessons Podcast. So again, if you're interested, just go on the website, go on Apple Podcasts, look for those and you can find, you can find them. Now, the one quick life lesson I want to share today is just the importance of living according to your design. Right? So what do I mean by living according to your design? The thing is, as an individual, you're designed to do something. You're designed to do something. You're designed to do something. No one is on this earth by mistake, right? Even if you were born out of wedlock or whatever, I certainly promise you, you're not here by mistake. If, if you're on this earth, there's a plan for your life in some way, shape or form, right? So work according to your design. The reason I'm saying work according to your design is many people on this earth, they try to be other people that they are not meant to be. The thing is, a photocopy is never going to be as good as the original, right? That's just the truth. So the thing is, there's something original about you. Live according to your original design, right? So what is that thing that you're really good at? What is that thing that you feel like you excel at at a high level above many other people? Like, for example, LeBron James is just good at basketball. He's just better than the average human being at basketball. Probably the greatest uh, basketball player of all time. And I'll probably get some fluff from those uh, Chicago Bulls fans, but whatever. I'm a LeBron, uh, LeBron fan. But anywho, right? But what is that thing that you do really well, right? That you know is original, is intrinsic to you, that just do better than other people, right? Why don't you find ways to build your life around that thing, right? Because the thing is, if you're working to your strengths, you're going to succeed at a very high level. If you're working to your weaknesses, uh, you're not going to be succeeding much at all right? I'm not saying you shouldn't work on your weaknesses, but it's better to function in your area of strength, right? Like, for example, the med students listening to me, I know that, you know, med students, they're like, oh, man, I saw this person got a, get a 270 from doing like this big Anki deck or whatever. If Anki decks are not your thing, then you should not be using Anki decks. Simple as that. Again, for me, I intrinsically, just being a person that has been in education for, for a long time, I intrinsically know how good Anki is. But for me, that's not the thing that worked for me. I did really well, thankfully to God, on my USMLE exams without doing Anki. We're just doing a lot of videos, right? So the thing is, at the end of the day, find what works for you. Don't try to copy other people. Be unique. Be original. I'm telling you, there's something original about you. Even your DNA is pretty unique, right? You have a different genetic makeup compared to pretty much every other person in the world. So I encourage you today, be unique. Be original. Don't copy other people. Again, photocopies are not the same thing as the original. If you see like, like a photocopy of a piece of paper, it doesn't look as good as the original writings, right? So again, it's very important. Very, very important. Be original. So thank you for listening to me today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. God bless you. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.